All right, what's going on, guys? Uh, we are going to go through an overhead press checklist today. We've done this for squatting. We've done it for benching. I got a request to do it for the overhead press, which we were overdue. So we're going to try and do it. Bear with me in this new uh, in this new format. So instead of me standing in front of the whiteboard where everything's pre-presented and I have to like stiffly and awkwardly navigate you through uh, each point, instead I'm going to try to go off the cuff. Now this might go a couple of ways. Uh, I'm a little nervous to do this actually, but I wanted to try to move to uh, more of like a digital whiteboard type template and see if I could do this a little more organically. Maybe it'll flow a little bit better. I don't know. So if at any point, if I do get off on a rant or if I do meander a little bit, which is it's not just possible, it's likely. Uh, everything will be segmented. I'll have each piece of this checklist broken off in timestamps. So go ahead and use the scroll bar to like fast forward if there's a specific piece of information you're looking for. But I'm going to try and make this as concise as possible without really neglecting any big points. Now we're gonna start with the main lifts. Now, with the main lifts within overhead, there are three big options that I recommend you focus on. I could do an entire video on how to pick which one you should spend time on, but really there's there's three options and I'm just gonna kind of gloss over it because getting too much in detail is beyond the scope of this. But the push press, the strict press, and the push jerk. And which one you're gonna pick is gonna be detent, uh, dependent entirely on your goals, uh, whether or not you're competing or if it's just aesthetics or if you want it really to just be a supplement for your benching ability. And whichever one it is, is perfectly okay. You just have to know so you can make a better decision. So starting off with the main lifts, uh, I wanna talk about uh, what each one has to offer so you can kind of get an idea on what the trade-off is, focusing on one versus another. So upper body strength, size, you could say versatility, as far as you know what other stuff it makes you good at. Uh, carry over to any of the other three. That's a big one. You know, knowing, you know, will your strict press make your push press better or vice versa? Uh, power, that's a good one. Just general speed, athletic development. So I'll do things kind of lazily. I'll do it in a binary, you know, yes or no, check or minus, because uh, again, we don't have all day to cover this. I just have to give you an idea. Uh, now to start off the push jerk, you really have no business doing the push jerk unless you're competing in strongman. If you're an Olympic lifter, it's an accessory for you. It's going to tie into everything else you're doing. So don't listen to me or this video because I'm not an Olympic lifting coach. Push jerking, which is jumping into the bar and then dropping back underneath it as you lock it out. That's a tactic in strongman and it's very useful on uh, logs, axle presses for reps. It can be very efficient if you're good at it. So I recommend all strongmen at some point at least get a handle on it just so they have that tool in their belt. But I don't recommend you jump into it if you're brand new. If you're still trying to figure out how to use your legs, how to coordinate, that is something that uh, you want to put later down the road okay get the foundation uh foundational stuff down first get a little size on your upper body learn how to push press learn how to use your legs uh so as far as upper body strength yes if you do dedicate your time to a push jerk over time it will get stronger but i wouldn't say optimally so in fact i don't think anybody would say it's an optimal upper body strength developer uh at least not when compared to the other ones so Push jerk is more of a technique, okay? It's more of something you want to use to highlight performance down the road or to augment performance down the road. Size, again, I dedicated myself to a push jerk when I was young for like a year and a half. I did get bigger, my shoulders exploded, but I would not say to the capacity that, again, strict pressing and push pressing does. So I wouldn't specifically use push press, or sorry, push jerking for size. Versatility, making you better at the others. No, again, push jerking is uh, a realization of strength and power. It's the end product. It's not necessarily as good developmentally. You will have to use other things eventually to build up your push jerk as opposed to having your push jerk be the main developmental thing. Carry over. Uh, no, it's very specific. I mean, yeah, a lot of power, a lot of power and speed is required for it. But as far as carry over to anything else, it's a very specific application of power. I wouldn't even have athletes use it, I don't think, because getting the timing, coordination, and power down to jump and then drop back under the weight. Um, not gonna make you better at a lot of other things, at least not a lot of you know real world things in like field sports or anything else I can think of. So it fails there. Strict pressing, yeah, you're gonna get upper body strength, you're gonna get size. Strict pressing can absolutely be a foundational movement that makes you a little better at the other things. 
Um, it's not guaranteed that 20 pound PR on your strict press will make your push shirt better. You still have to time things so that you can optimize uh, coordination and, and, and timing down the road. But in general, strict pressing will be a base phase uh, type movement that helps set you up for success in the other two. So I would say it is versatile. It can potentially help you with the other ones. Carry over to other things. Yes and no, getting a strong upper body will help with a lot of other things, but not in the capacity that something like a push press will because it's a little more whole body and you get the benefit of getting the power from your legs generated into your uh, upper body pressing movement. So strict pressing is a little more one dimensional. It really is just delts and triceps. So I'm gonna say carry over to other activities. So I'm gonna say carry over to other activities. I'm gonna say no. Uh, for power, uh, again, no, it's typically not an explosive movement. I mean, you can get a lot of slow, grindy strict presses, which is one of the reasons that it actually works well as a size and strength builder. A little bit of a trade-off there. Push press, I'm going to say, is just the king of the upper body movements. It really does check all these boxes. Uh, I have gotten a lot of size and strength out of just focusing on my push press because you do have to lock out the weight on your own. So you get the benefit of overload. You're using more weight. It's kind of like a slingshot for your shoulders. Uh, you get to use your legs to move more weight, uh, but it's also powerful, but it also requires lockout strength at the top. So you're checking a lot of boxes here. You're doing a lot of things at once, which makes this a really valuable movement. Uh, versatility, yes, it's gonna make you better at the other ones. When my push press is really good, I know my jerk and my strict press tend to be pretty good. Uh, carry over to other movements. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I'm, if I'm doing anything that requires upper body strength, I think push pressing probably has the most to offer. Um, even other movements as far as like dumbbell presses or uh, stone pressing, sandbag pressing, fingal fingers. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking anything that requires uh, explosive yet strong uh, movement forward with your uh, your entire body, you know, through your arms. Absolutely. Uh, power. And yeah, it does because push presses should be quick. You should learn how to fire off. So this is really my favorite uh, general overhead press movement. It's the staple of all of my strongman stuff. And it's what I think newbies should start out learning how to do before they go into something like a pusher. Eventually when you get good, you can augment your performance a bit with this, but strict pressing is gonna be a foundational movement. Now for you guys that are oriented towards your bench press or aesthetics, or you're mainly looking to grow your shoulders, strict pressing is absolutely a viable, a viable option. For you strongman competitors, I recommend starting with a push press. Uh, and if you're interested in just general upper body strength in general, you can't really go wrong with push pressing as a staple movement. So I wanna talk a little bit now about how you're going to organize your training, because again, some of these movements are the realization of strength and power development. You know, the, the push jerk is something that you use to test. So you spend all this time building up your physical attributes and then as you get closer to a meet, you peak with dialing in your push jerk and then that's that's the finale. That's the thing that you're using to demonstrate that performance. So with base and peak, I mean, you know, in broad terms, let's just talk about strength and skill. And you can be talking about a contest peak or you could be talking about a just a longer period of specificity. So remember, base is widening out all of the things that will help raise your peak up, right? The wider your base is, the taller your potential peak is. So if you widen out your base first, you raise your peak and then you can spend time specifically chasing that peak and doing things that will dial in those specific skills. So that's what we think of with this dynamic. This is what I push a lot, but it just helps you divide your training into, into periods. This is the essence of periodization. It's just more intuitive and less complex. So with the base and peak model, you wanna figure out which movements are going to contribute uh, the most to increasing your potential for performance. So let's take a push press, for instance. Uh, you know that you're going to need a uh, leg drive. You know that you're going to need power in your upper body. You know that you're going to need mass. You know that you're going to want to do a lot of volume, uh, potentially a lot of non-specific movements to raise those things up. So a strict press is gonna be a very good thing, along with a, a lot of other variations, you know, like dips, dumbbells, uh, whatever. The goal here being that you are going to try to build size and general strength. And it's going to be very non-specific. You also want more volume. So, you know, more sets, more reps. You're also going to not want to shy away from fatigue. So you're gonna have high levels of fatigue. And that's essentially 
what is going to be the hallmark of your base phase. Now, this is pretty universal. This isn't just uh, this isn't just overhead pressing specifically. This is all of your movements. Now, again, we said strict pressing is a good base uh, base movement. You wouldn't put a push jerk in here because it has less to carry over. That's not a base quality. So. Once you establish this base, you might spend six weeks, 12 weeks, you might spend four months doing this specific type of work before you decide to transition into a peak. Now, a peak can be a contest peak, that's a subset of a peak, or it could be just a longer general period where you're doing skill specific work. But for the hypothetical push presser, and let's make sure we know who we're talking about here. So for the hypothetical push presser, going into a peak phase, you are going to want uh, more specific work. That's a big one. You're going to want to spend more time actually dialing in technique with the movement you plan on using when you test. Uh, so technique work. And it's also important to know that that technique work changes as the weights get heavier because technique work at 60% hits a lot different once you start to get to 90, 95, and then close to 100%. And if you're not dialed in with some of these movements, you might come in feeling strong, but you might find that you whiff when it's on the line, when you feel that weight in your hands and you gotta go 100%, you might find that you have a hard time putting it together. So that's where a good peak phase comes in. So more specific, and that ultimately means less fluff. That's a big one to know. Less accessory, uh, less accessory, less variations. Everything's more oriented towards what you're specifically going to test. You're talking about less volume, okay? Less sets, less reps. And what, what that is going to do is allow you to recover because as the percentages climb up, as the percentages climb up, that's going to involve a new stress that you need to recover from. So if you can take the volume down, give that buffer with recovery, you're gonna to respond to this novel stimulus of heavier weight a lot better. And because of this, fatigue is gonna drop. So you're, again, you're not doing as much variation. You're, you're allowing uh, yourself to grow from this new stimulus. So now that we have this basic template, what we can do is start to plug in movements that fit what it is that we're trying to do. So using this model, let's just broadly consider two different phases of training. So if you're interested in hitting, let's say a 50 pound overhead press PR this year, this is how you're gonna sp uh, spread it out. You might do three months of each one. Um, again, it can vary, might go six weeks, might go four months. It's really up to you. I mean, if you feel like you're getting a ton out of the base phase and you're just growing like crazy, there's no reason to shut it down. You don't have to. This transition here is what you do when things start to get stale. So if you've been five months doing specific heavy work in a peak phase and it gets stale, you're like, okay, I'm due to transition back to the base phase. Um, but let's start with the movement. So again, let's just say we got a push presser. So I know I'm gonna push press throughout the week because I need to build the foundation of technique and comfort and speed and timing and all that that is going to set me up for a bigger attempt down the road. So let's say it's a given that that's gonna be my main exercise. Uh, I might follow that up and this could depend on your frequency and your split. It might be all in the same workout. It might be distributed across a few days. But I might say, okay, well, I want to get my shoulders a little bigger. So I might strict press. And there's other variations you could do. You don't have to do just a standing military press. You can do it seated or standing. You can go behind the neck. I know a lot of people hate it. I think behind the neck is a fantastic movement as long as you have good mobile shoulders and you don't get reckless with it. Dumbbell pressing is another one. All of these strict variations, you could even do like a hammer strength. Hammer strength machines are good. Anything that takes your legs out of it and develops your delts and triceps through a more uh, full range of motion is going to be a good base exercise. Range of motion is consistent with increased volume because it's more general time spent working under tension. So that's a good thing to think about. So strict variations I think are a must specifically in the base phase. Um, and I recommend that that always be kind of a staple. Now you might find that over time as your push press goes up that your recovery with strict movements, maybe your joints bu bug you a little bit so you're gonna to wanna to do some discovery to find out which grip, which bars, which movements are a little friendlier on your shoulders. Don't stick with something just because you think it's magical if it's actually eating you up. So strict pressing is good. And then we go to secondary and uh, tertiary movements. Dips are a fantastic exercise. I love dips as a main pressing movement. Uh, it works your shoulders a lot, but it's also very tricep heavy. So going into tricep work, you know the dips can be kind of the heavy tricep variation. And you might then go to Skull crushers, I like to do them with dumbbells with a neutral grip because they're easier on my elbows. Uh, I like 
things that isolate my triceps that where I feel them working because I've had a hard time with activation in the past. So you might find even kickbacks and press downs for high reps are good to get some blood in and get them sore. Any extension is going to be good. Now, there's heavier compound work that you can do. Dips are an example of that. But you might see JM presses, any type of heavy lockout work, uh, pin presses, floor presses, and so on. Now, a lot of these I like to save for when we get into the peak phase because they're consistent with getting heavier and getting some overloaded. Uh, but this is a good split of uh, base work, and we're going to want to keep the reps higher. Uh, some of you strength periods will like to keep the reps low, and that's fine. You can still do high volume with low reps. There's just a different way to do it. I actually really like to keep the reps higher here. So I'll start out with eight sets of 12 for a base phase, and I won't think about switching to the peak until I'm in the, the heavy end of the eight to maybe six range. But eight to 12 is a really good base phase, even for something like push presses. And I'll talk a little bit more about what type of uh, progressions we can use in that base phase. Some of these smaller movements, I like to get 20 plus. Some of the heavier ones like skull crushers, I'll keep eight to 12. And that gets you a good variety. Um, now, when you're doing these movements, I'm not a big fan of shoulder isolation in the sense of like raises. You absolutely can do raises. Uh, upright rows are a good movement because they hit your rear delt. Bent raises are a good movement because they hit your rear delts and traps a little more. But aside from that, I, I don't really like to throw a lot of front and side raises because I find all these pressing variations very, very heavy on your delt as it is. Now, you might find that you need a little more volume if you're struggling to grow, and that's okay. That's a personal choice. But if you are going to throw those movements in, those go in the base phase. Now, getting into the peak, first thing you're going to want to know is the reps are going to come down. So six reps and under is what you're shooting for here. By the time you transition into the peak phase, you're worried about specificity, not just in movement selection, but in the threshold you're working in that is strength oriented. So six reps and under is where you wanna go. You're still doing your push presses, but now the percentages are climbing up. Percentages are starting to climb. So you're starting to get that technical work in the context of those heavier loads. Uh, as far as movements, you're probably gonna put these variations on the back burner. If you're training once per week, which you absolutely can, you can still do these variations so you get enough work in where you're still doing some strict work. Uh, and then you might want to emphasize specifically on compound tricep work, eliminating the isolation stuff. And that's going to be uh, the most specific way that you can start to handle overload. Um, I also like partials or anything that really uh, starts to expose your nervous system to, to more weight. So this is where, again, you're looking at pin work, uh, bands, anything that overloads the top that coincides. Think about accommodating resistance or top end lockout work is coinciding with the peak phase because this is where we're getting the nervous system dialed in. So I like to save those movements for the back end and you start to feel it every week that you get better at the pin presses. You're gonna feel that bar leave your shoulder a little bit faster when you do your push presses. So that's one of my favorite things to do uh, is structure wise. Now, if you're going multiple times a week and this is something I'll do as well, if I move into a peak phase, I'll go from, let's say, once a week, you know, maybe benching one day, push pressing another day, to two to three times per week. Now, when we do this, we're not gonna have as much opportunity to do these secondary movements. You might be able to put in another variation, but you're not gonna do three or more variations three times a week just for your overhead. That's gonna be overkill. You're gonna have a hard time recovering. I like this because this allows us to focus specifically on um, technique. And this is as specific as it gets. So this is where you're gonna notice the movement happening quicker, your coordination's gonna get better, your timing on how to punch through is gonna get better. So I do prefer frequency if you don't have to accommodate for anything else. There's times where frequency doesn't work if you got 10 different things you gotta focus on and you have to compartmentalize those stressors. So it's all on a needs base uh, basis. But if this is your primary goal for this phase of training, you can absolutely move to something and it would look like a DUP phase where you're gonna be working through different thresholds. It might be heavy, light, medium, it might be, or it might be strength, speed, hypertrophy, or size. There's different ways to run through it. But if you're doing different loads, different protocols, in a way that's sustainable, you're pressing, uh, progressing them forward in a way that's sustainable, uh, this is gonna get you the fastest uh, return as far as technique goes and starting to get those movements dialed in. So I am an absolute huge fan of frequency, again, if you don't have to work around any other limitation. 
you're you're probably not going to get the most out of your push press if you have to train you know 10 other strongman events or if you're having to fit in high frequency squatting and deadlifting as well uh, or if you're trying to especially if you're trying to bench remember this guys i swear if you are going to take this route you're going to do high frequency do not bench on another day your bench work needs to be fused into this if that's something you do want to keep up uh, I would recommend doing it uh, lockout specific work mainly if you do horizontal pressing, but work it in as a variation on the same day. Don't try to do high frequency push pressing and think you're going to layer that with uh, benching. That will chew you up pretty dang quick. All right, so just to go over that uh, again real quick, you know, for it, you know, one time a week, two times a week, three times a week. And I'm not going to go above that because really none of you have any business going four times a week. That's if you do that, it's because you think it's going to be the way to just work twice as hard to get twice the gains and you guys end up chewing yourselves up. So a split for one, uh, one time a week might be your main movement. Again, I'm just using push presses as an example, a main variation, uh, which let's just say a strict press for the sake of argument. Um, and then going into your accessories. So I already said that I like dips and I like tricep work, any type of extension you can think of. Now you can rotate these out based on need or based on which phase you're in. So instead of strict pressing, you might get to the peak phase and say, hey, I wanna do some pin presses instead to try to, to try to overload, to try to really dial in my nervous system. I might wanna do some flat pressing uh, to again, try to work on my lockout. Floor presses are fantastic. Uh, close grip, close grip incline is good. Uh, close grip benching. So you have a long list of potential accessories that you could use that are going to augment uh, your ability to push weight over your head. The key is that these are all delt and tricep dominant exercises. Uh, and then these partial movements, these heavy overload lockout movements do really well to set you up for your tricep isolation. Now, if we're going two times a week, again, uh, we gotta start hacking away at some of the uh, excess isolation work. So I would recommend one main movement, I would recommend following that up with a variation, uh, another press variation, and then follow that up with one tricep exercise. And the rest is gonna have to go to either your lower body or your rowing movements. So you might go push press day one, push press day two, uh, and day one, you might make more lockout heavy. So let's say you follow that up with a floor press. Day two, you might make more, uh, more range heavy. So let's say you follow that up with a behind the neck press to get some range, to get a burn in your uh, delts. And then you could follow that up, let's say dumbbell skull crusher is a good thing to follow floor presses up with. That's a heavy uh, tricep exercise followed with uh, a lighter, more kind of range, more oriented tricep exercise. Uh, push press behind the neck press. And let's say this is a bit of a lighter tricep exercise. You use something like band press downs. You just really go for a burn. Now, this is about as much as you need. If you're going twice a week, you don't need five, six exercises of pressing and pressing accessory on each day. So then you can start to go about your split. How do you follow up your uh, your progression? Well, uh, light, heavy might be a good way to go about it. Uh, heavy can be your substantial, your main progression. And light can just be arbitrarily, you know, 10% lighter, but everything else is exactly the same just to make sure you can recover. Another option is to go something like, you know, volume intensity or volume intensity, you might do repeating sets. You know, you might do a five by eight or something or intensity. It might be, you know, let's say a top set of five. There's a million different progressions. You just have to know ahead of time what your goal is, how you're going to plan your recovery around everything else. And that'll let you know what you can get away with. Um, and then that will allow you the ability to set your progression in a way that fits your needs three times a week. Now you could go three times a week. You could go, and this is something I only recommend for people if you're vets. Uh, you could split up between, let's say a jerk and a push press, and then maybe you use a different implement on day three. So I don't know, uh, log push press. That's one option. I absolutely do not recommend you do this uh, if you are new and you're trying to figure these movements out. You newbies need more time with the same movement. Master one movement before you try to do all of them. That's huge. Um, but this is something and you could do everything at about the same threshold uh, or you could do them at different thresholds for movements that are appropriate. Again, there's too many ways to organize this to really count. 
Now, three times a week is, is essentially going to be a DUP phase, daily undulating periodization. That means you're going to do something markedly different in a different specific threshold. So this is where, I mean, heavy, light, medium isn't specifically DUP. People mistake it because this is just heavier, lighter, medium efforts based on, you know, heavy might be, you know, a really hard four by five. Light might be, you know, two by five, you know, 10% lighter. Medium might be, you know, three by five at the same weight as, as your heavy day. Uh, heavy, light, medium, there's a lot of different ways you could do it. But these are specifically different thresholds. It's just easier and harder. Uh, DUP is actually going to be working specifically different thresholds. So you might have like a strength day, a speed day, and a, a mass day, hypertrophy day. I hate writing hypertrophy. Uh, in which case, you might be working in the... Uh, you know, fives range on the strength day. You might be doing fast threes on the speed day. You might be doing eight to 10 on the mass day. And that's another way to do it. And if you apply that, and by the way, you can apply these high rep ranges with push presses and with jerks. I've done it, it works. So remember that when you're trying to organize this. Now, if you're looking for potential progressions to run, I gave you a few easy examples. There are too many progressions to find. I recommend finding an easy one. Don't beat yourself up trying to do really elaborate next level programming with this stuff. Find your split, find what fits into your schedule, populate it with appropriate exercises accordingly, and then assign a very easy progression. There's too many to count. An easy one, if we're just going over easy progressions, like one of my favorites, five by five with a plus set. Start at, damn it. If you start at, let's say, 70%, that's something like a 12 rep max, meaning you do five, 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 and then on set number five, you do as many as you can. Maybe you get 12. Then you add a certain amount of weight. This can be done two ways. I got this from the Grayskull LP, uh, and that's just uh, add five pounds every single session, and you can run that indefinitely. Uh, I actually prefer to do it faster and more aggressive. So I'll go from 70 to 75, to 80 to 85. So I'll actually top this thing out within four or five weeks. And by doing that, I'll reset or I'll progress forward into a different split. So you gotta know your deadline uh, when you pick your jumps. Um, but either way, this works fantastically well. Every time you add weight to it, the volume goes up and there's an intensity, intensity in the form of effort. So that works really well. That's one of my favorites, that's pretty universal. Uh, another one I like is, uh, work you up to a top set. This is auto-regulated. So maybe you hit a top 10 and then you follow it up with the same weight with three sets of six. Uh, next time, maybe you do a top eight and then you follow it up four sets of five. The next time you do a top six and then you follow it up with five sets of four. I actually use this exact three week wave uh, for myself and for my wife and it works fantastically well. These are all just different, interesting, unique ways to do the same thing. I like this one because it's auto-regulated and it's on a three week wave. So there's variety week to week and you can run through you know five cycles before you know it. And all of a sudden your top 10, your top eight, your top six uh, have gone up immensely. Um, and then I like this one because it's more straightforward and I can judge each week uh, how appropriate my jumps are gonna be. They both work fantastically well. Uh, and there's too many progressions out there to count. In fact, I'm thinking of putting together a book of progressions uh, in as much as I can make it useful and not just a distraction that paralyzes you guys with uh, unnecessary options. So summarizing variations, your main lift, uh, I would say base variations, we could separate out from peak ones. And then some of the variations are just, you know, variations for the sake of having something different. Um, so if your main movement is, let's say a push press, uh, some of the good base variations, you could do strict, you know, anything uh, on a different bar is going to be a good variation. Log, Swiss bar, even a, uh, something like a camber bar where it swings a little bit can add, add a little something extra. So on these variations, you're gonna want an extra element of control so anything that's destabilized would be good here. You're going to want um, anything disadvantaged. That's a good way to think of it. Disadvantaged, uh, anything with more range of motion. So strict, again, strict pressing is a great example. 
Um, anything under a tempo, anything that's unstable, even if you're hanging bands, uh, weights from bands from the bar, those all work very well. Uh, once you move into the peaking phase, your variation should be heavier and oriented towards more overload. That's a big one. More overload. It's neurological. We're really focused on the neurological growth here, which means coordination. It means uh, force production, rate of force development, and it means skill and technique. So that's where everything gets a lot more specific. Whew, guys, I'm hitting the wall. I already hear myself just starting to drone on as I try to piece this thing together off the cuff. Um, yeah, I need some ideas on how to keep, uh, keep some levity in the midst of these long form presentations. So we covered a lot about uh, programming and basic structure. Uh, the last pieces that are going to come together are uh, really just your deadline. And that's going to help you pick what type of progression you're going to use. So if I've got, you know, one to six months, then I can go on just the slowest cookie cutter, most linear type of progression I can find where I'm just adding five pounds every time. There's nothing wrong with that. Or I might level up into a three week wave that runs through the same type of pattern, you know, something like the top 10, top eight, top six. There's a ton of options just like that. But I might really just take my time and there's nothing wrong with that. If it works, if you're a novice, early intermediate, these are new movements for you, you might be able to grind this out. Uh, if you're more intermediate, a three week wave is still very sustainable, you know, the five, three, one type wave. And you can run through that for a very, very long time. So if you don't have anything on the horizon and you wanna just flesh out as much training time as possible, with uh, let's say your base type structure, absolutely go for it. Another option would be to do a more aggressive periodized approach where you are anticipating shorter periods dedicated towards singular types of training, a singular threshold that you're gonna work in. So instead, if I'm only going off, let's say six weeks, at this point, I'm going to want to fill out this six weeks. So if I'm starting over here, I'm going to want an aggressive run up until I hit that brick wall because we always go kind of light, medium, and towards the end of those periods, towards the ends of the ends of those blocks, we know we're going to have a shift in training. We know we're going to deload or we're going to have a period of recovery. So this is where we go ham right there, right? So that allows us to jump up a lot more aggressively and that can uh, really influence what type of progression you pick. You might start with something that's at a low percentage. Let's say you're doing eights and a low percentage might be 60%, right? You might say, okay, what's an eight, rate, uh, eight rep max? Something, you know, 75, 80-ish percent. Okay, well, I'm gonna make damn sure week number six, I'm right up against 75, 80%, and I'm gonna make that my heaviest eighth before you drop back down and reset. And you can do that uh, just by shifting the percentage forward a little bit, repeating. You can do that by moving directly from 80%. You can drop it to fours, and that'll allow you to move back up once again, where you go 80% and you can handle fours up to 85, maybe even 90% if you're having a lot of success before again, dropping back down again and building back up. So remember your deadline, and this is important to know how you're gonna organize your training. Are you looking for short, aggressive growth before shifting forward into a new type of training? Or are you looking for a longer, more sustainable type of growth? So I'll finish this just by giving a brief example of what I did. I had about six weeks to prep my base and then about six weeks to peak for a max axle press. And I was coming from a low, I actually had a bit of a layoff for a few months, so my numbers were in the tank. So I actually had to really adhere strictly to this base peak dynamic, base peak right there. And I really made sure that I spent my time in the early part really fleshing it out. So I knew that I was gonna go with a jerk. Uh, down here. So I knew a push jerk was going to be how I was going to hit my biggest uh, biggest axle. Uh, I also knew that push presses were hugely developmental for me in the past and I could bring my push press back very quick and given how low my push press was at the start, I knew that I needed to bring that back alive to kind of get the foundation of my leg drive and my timing back before I really started to hit heavier jerks. So what I did is I took more of a bodybuilding approach. Uh, in the beginning with my push press, uh, I was training it once a week and I did a volume progression. I did the 
the five by five with the plus set, which worked really well. I started really light and I ramped up quickly knowing my deadline was this six week threshold. I had six weeks to get aggressively uh, towards something that was difficult and it got real heavy there. Uh, I also made sure some of my favorite movements I put in on a secondary day, I did uh, strict pressing for really high volume. I would actually do like a 15, 12, 10, eight, and then back to 15. And I just moved that up very slowly, very linearly. And I did that on kind of a feeder day where I would do uh, some tricep work and I would do, I did occlusion training actually, just to get an extra hit to my triceps without damaging my elbows. And that actually went a long way. I did a lot of my upper back work there as well. And that actually went a long way to padding my push press, which I'd follow up with a little bit more lockout work. So here you're looking at things like floor presses and just things to bring my raw pressing ability back to life. And everything here was in eh, probably six to eight rep range. So that's day one, that's day two. And then I would do all of my rowing and bodybuilding stuff around that. So flash forward to my peak and I have two days of very specific work. And at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm starting out with one and finishing with the other. So I'm getting a little bit of both. The last two weeks, I'm just push jerking. So if day one, I start out with a push jerk, I move to a push press. And again, I'm just interested in specificity. Remember, volume is going up, specificity is going up. So I'm cutting out the fluff. I'm just doing the main lifts where coordination is big. Uh, neurological activation goes up, uh, overload goes up, and fatigue goes way, way down. That's what I'm looking at. I said volume goes up here. That's wrong. Sorry. And I meant intensity. Intensity. Intensity both in terms of weight and effort. That's what we're looking for here. Now, at this point, I'm not doing really any, any tricep work. At this point, I'm not doing any strict pressing. At this point, I just put both of these on a very aggressive, short, linear run-up where I'm doing uh, singles on one day and I'm doing triples on another day. And actually, my triples, I take a little easier. I don't push these to limit at all. I keep the effort low. And that's just how I make recovery happen. I can't push the envelope twice a week, every week for six weeks. That doesn't work. So this is more practice. Uh, this is more repetition. Uh, and then if I am going to add something on top of it, this is where I'm doing overload work. So I'll add into all of this standing pin presses. And that's one of the most specific lockout oriented movements I can do. It's going to get my nervous system dialed in and it's going to make as the weeks go on, these attempts feel lighter and lighter. And this is very generally how I map out my overhead press training. So again, you have to keep in mind what your main lift is, what your goal is surrounding it. You have to know how to organize them into different phases of training, given the deadline you have. And then all you have to do, lay out your split, add on a progression and stick to it. Wash, rinse, repeat. So that's all I have for the overhead press checklist for today. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought about this presentation versus the other whiteboard presentations I've given. I'm always looking for feedback from you guys, so thanks for that. So thanks for watching, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.